This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk, I interview Paul Shapiro. Paul is the CEO and lead developer of My Monero. My Monero was started by Ricardo Spagni, aka Fluffy Pony, in 2014 as the first third party wallet for Monero. It started as a web wallet. With Paul as lead developer, it has since evolved greatly launching desktop and mobile apps, like their user-friendly iOS Lite wallet. Android is launching soon. In this interview, we talk about all the progress MyMonero has made and some of the things that are in the pipeline. MyMonero is not just working on consumer-facing applications to make Monero more usable for the end user, but is also building infrastructure, making it easier for crypto businesses like exchanges and other wallets to work with and easily integrate Monero into their products and services. Paul is in this for all the right reasons. He is extremely passionate about the Monero project at large and is using his skills as an experienced developer and his creativity to innovate in the space. My takeaway is Monero has come a very long way in terms of usability. With community trusted projects like Cake, My Monero, and Monerujo, user-friendly wallets for Monero is absolutely no longer an issue and the real innovation is just beginning. Paul spoke to me offline as well about some of the big ideas he's working on that he's not ready to mention publicly yet. He's constantly developing ideas for how to make Monero more usable as a currency. Exciting times are ahead for Monero. Monero Talk starts now. All right, so Paul, thanks for coming on. Paul of My Monero. Hey, what's up, Doug? It's Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, it's been a while, actually. Uh, so I went back through through the archives, the Monero Talk archives, and you were one of uh, one of our first guests. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, I do remember that very well. I know exactly where I was, what like what Airbnb I was staying at at the time as well, and uh, yeah, I guess that kind of makes me an OG now, right? Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> you're, you're an OG also. So yeah, I was checking that out. I was watching it, and uh, at the time, we, obviously, we talked about my Monero and other things. Um, mm-hmm. And I guess we we started to talk about also, I guess, things that you kind of saw that you wanted to potentially add to my Monero, kind of like big ideas, things that you were working on. So I guess it, w- it would be nice to maybe talk about then versus now, like where, how far, how. How far has my Monero come since then and where do you want to bring it to? My goodness. Um, I spend every single day thinking about that and I don't let myself rest, uh, mostly because we've had a lot in mind that we wanted to do for a long time. And this is, I think, um, like basically there are, I guess, two categories of things that we've had to do. One of them is uh, fixing a lot of the infrastructure or making it faster. And the second thing is introducing new features. And so we had this like significant burden to, um, improve the light wallet server architecture, um, just like match the, the scale and the load that we were seeing on that. Um, and so a lot of the time that we, a lot of the development time that we spent over the past couple of years has actually been a lot of like, chores and repaying of tech debt and things like that. But, um, in the meantime, what that's turned into is, um, like, so, so just to, um, just to rewind a little bit, um, like what, what I work on is called my Monero and my Monero is a wallet for Monero is actually, I think the first third party wallet for Monero that focuses really strongly on usability and accessibility. And it's like, okay, it's not necessarily for a power user, But it's like, how can we make the best wallet for like in the most usable, usable sort of experience? Um, And so one of the things that was necessary for that way back in 2014 was, okay, well, if we want to have a web browser experience for using Monero, 
it's not really tenable for someone to like import the blockchain into the browser. So there had to be this server that um, scans in the background or it doesn't have to scan in the background, but it scans on your behalf. And then, you know, that uh, then you sort of like use it through the browser. Um, fast forward now, what's like five years later and we've done a ton of work on the underlying infrastructure and it kind of turned into this um, real time system because they're like the original API and the whole infrastructure that we built was, um, was geared strongly towards a single page per load per fetch from the server, like a single web page per fetch. And that just doesn't work for an application designed for desktop or for mobile. And so there were things that we wanted to do to the API and uh, we just, I mean, it's hard to juggle all these things as a small team without any external funding, but um you know, eventually what we managed to do was, uh, was rework. And this is kind of a, one of the cool things that no one really knows yet. Um, I've been keeping it really quiet for months and months now. Um, the API that we, that we had built since 2014, um, we knew that we wanted to improve a lot of things in it. Um, and so we, um, recently, like in the past, uh, eight months, um, fully, you know, fully like uh, augmented it and enhanced it and turned it into a real time API. So it's a push based API now. So like, for example, instead of having to fetch all your transactions every single time you talk to the server, like asking it for your transaction history, because, you know, like in Monero, there are very frequent, frequent reorganizations of the blockchain. And so you could potentially have like one transaction that's in a different place than another or something like that. Um, things like that happen. And so um, the API was designed like that initially. And um, that makes a real-time push-based API very, like it makes it more complicated to implement. And that's one of the reasons that something like that hasn't existed for Monero yet. It exists for Bitcoin, you know, that have like blockchain.info where you can use a WebSocket connection and it'll just like give you information about deposits in a push-based system. Um, so you're not like constantly querying a server and it's like a, a wire service or something like that. Um, you know, it's like as fast as it can possibly be pushed. Um, so Bitcoin has had that, but, um, Monero sees a lot more reorgs than Bitcoin and Monero also requires a light wallet server to actually scan the blockchain for these transactions. So, um, so we managed to do that and, uh, the client code for integrating with that is completely built. Um, it's got, you know, full test coverage and it's quite sophisticated the, the API itself is quite sophisticated. A lot of man hours have been put into it. And um, so like one of the cool things about the client being implemented for this WebSocket API is that uh, we didn't even have that for the Light Wallet API. Um, there was no standard client. So now it's just a matter of taking this like library of JavaScript and just um, it's like two lines of code basically to 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 use like the, um, the entry point to the library and all the networking and all the parsing and like all that stuff is implemented. So it's literally a factor of it's, it's literally a matter of like two days to implement Monero, like the best Monero wallet API into a new wallet. And so over the past eight months, completely in secret, I've been contacting a lot of companies and being like, Hey, we got this new cool thing. And that turned into contacting it was, it started off as like wallet providers because, um, we provide bulk wallet scanning hosting, uh, to companies like edge. Uh, they use, they use our hosting for Monero. Um, we signed a couple others, uh, as the months went by, like literally a couple others. Um, and so, you know, I started, uh, you know, doing a lot of business development and stuff like that and reaching out to try to see who this would be useful for. I mean, I knew it would be useful for anybody who's interested in Monero integration, but um, like who, who is this really appropriate for? And so that kind of turned into, well, this system as a real time system, um, one of the major advantages of it is like, well, and by the way, now, like now that I can share a lot of this stuff, um, one of the things that we built at the same time is support for sub addresses in light wallet server. So like full wallets already have that because it's just Monero core, like Cake Wallet, Monero, 
they all use core Monero code, and so they're scanning, so they get sub addresses. But anyway, we added that, and one of, so with this real time deposit, uh, not deposit, but uh, observation API, um, it's really applicable for observing deposits on sub addresses, for for example exchanges. So I, we were thinking, well, why don't we approach exchanges? This will be useful as an on site kind of installation thing, and. Um, that's one of the things that I've been doing over the past few months as well. But stuff like that takes a really long time. Um, we think it'd be a very valuable um, arrangement to have uh, members, like members of the Monero community who are actual contributors as well, um, being like sort of technical advisors to these groups. And so uh, we're interested in, in, you know, consulting basically, but um, stuff like that takes a really long time to do new integrations, no matter how much better the, the new technology is. Um, so that, that ended up taking more time as well. And so I'm still working on that, but um, I guess while I'm on the topic, um, this is really just, it's not strictly related to improvements to, to my Monero API, but um, well, actually it is related slightly. Uh, one of the other things we've been doing um, that managed to get done over the past year is, uh, exposing support for hardware devices in the My Monero client side API. So now you can use the light wallet server to scan and you use your hardware wallet as, uh, to hold the keys and to form transactions and stuff. Um, it hasn't made it into application, the My Monero application yet. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work on that um, with different people and we have made uh, progress um, in terms of developments. Um, we get a bit technical, but yeah. So the, the API thing is one of the biggest um, one of the biggest things we've wanted to do for a long time. But um, there are these like two other things that, uh, well, one or two other things that there's really a single thing um, that I've had in my mind for years now, and um, we've had to lay a lot of groundwork to even get to the point where it would be possible. And now we finally reached that point. So. That's something I'm not going to really reveal yet. Um, oh, come it, on. What, no much detail, detail, but <laughs> I, will say, I will say one thing. Um, I'm very interested in talking to uh, people who want to accept Monero as payment uh, for anything, like services, goods, so basically like merchants who are accepting Monero or who want to accept Monero. Um, it's like, it's become a really interesting project to me lately because, um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, like so many things going on in the cryptocurrency community these days. And there's so many factors that are just playing together. But, um, we noticed that in, in the Bitcoin debate that's happening on Twitter, crypto Twitter, um, you see a lot of people who are saying stuff like, you know, you have to hold your Satoshis. And so... And, you know, there's also this massive um, uh, debate about privacy and the, the actual safety of using Bitcoin um, and all of this stuff. And so um, at the same time, like if people are holding their Bitcoins, then they're not going to be transacting with them and spending them. And so one thing I think is very interesting about Monero is that it's very applicable for actual usage in an economy. And maybe people can like store their value in Bitcoin if they want to, because in the short term, it's like a better speculative play or something, or they really believe that like Bitcoin and Monero will coexist together in the future. But, um, but I mean, um, I see Monero as like, um, a technology that people wouldn't be afraid to actually use for like actual transactions, like if they're spending wallet or something like that. So, um, so I, I think Monero is very interesting, um, for people who want to earn money, uh, it's it's a it's got so many advantages. Um, but you've, and you've so, been reaching out to people that are looking to like vendors that are looking to accept it. Yeah, or? vendors. I'm looking to talk with vendors, and yeah, or I mean, even people who aren't in cryptocurrency right now who who want to who are interested in it, and who you know, I mean, there's such a barrier to entry, and that's that's um. That's one of the problems. Uh, I got this. I'm kind of going to go on a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's an interesting topic um, in terms of barrier to entry and you know usability and stuff like that. Just an example of like why cryptocurrency is difficult for people to accept, and why maybe it's uh, difficult for it to really spread widely at the moment. Um, 
if you know if if I'm a vendor, and I, I think I've probably talked about this so much that it's kind of annoying at this point. But if I'm a vendor and I want to you know, accept Bitcoin, for example, I have to get set up with a whole Bitcoin wallet. I have to know a lot about how it works or I just have to like put my faith in, um, what people have told me about how to set this stuff up generally, or I'd have to go with a solution that's completely custodial and it's not really Bitcoin. You know, it's more like, you know, you just have this like account that's on your phone or whatever. Um, so, so basically like if I'm a vendor, I have to have an address that uh, a, a buyer can send money to. And so that means I have to, there's actually a barrier to entry in terms of knowledge. And there's also an interaction that has to happen where I have to exchange the destination address to the buyer. And that's completely different. Well, not completely different, but it's, it's definitely more frictiony than just a cash exchange where we can just walk around and just like the value is in the object. And even if the person doesn't believe that that object is valuable, if they take it to an appraiser, they're going to be like, I'll take that off your hands for something that, you know, for this. Yeah. This yeah. Apple or whatever. yeah I mean, I, when I re listened to our old episode, I remember you had brought that up as well. So basically like the open dime type concept. So like the yeah, bearer I mean, asset, physical Monero. So you've been thinking yeah, the along fact that it's not solved yet. I'm sorry. You've been working on, on, on projects in this area or just, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, um, I'm probably becoming tiresome to the knowethers, the Monero research lab researchers at this point, because occasionally I'll ping them and I'll be like, Hey, I've got this new idea. And they'll be like, well, it's tricky because of this or whatever. But, um, it's just kind of in the back of my head. Cause, um, I don't, I don't strictly think it really can be solved with digital assets because the bearer of a key which is necessary for, for being able to spend something for being able to spend an output, they can just spend it. Even if they give the key to someone else, they can spend it before the other person can spend it. So it's a difficult or impossible problem, but in a physical sense, it could be interesting. Like, um, one recent idea that I had, which obviously it would take R and D to do this, but it's like, okay, well, we, we want to end up with like a secure element of some kind. And we want to end up with like, mass producible open dime type things that we don't have to rely on open dime to produce. And, you know, they're just basically, it needs to be producible at home and it needs to be something that people can verify the, the integrity of. Um, and so I was like, well, what if we take conductive ink and we print a large circuit on a little like note thing. So like, um, it's visually verifiable what the circuit, you know, what its structure is. Um, and like to generate a key, maybe you could like rub one input to generate enough entropy or whatever. Um, but it, you know, if you kind of like look into that idea, well, okay, you need some memory to store the key. And if the memory is auditable visually, then you can tell what the key is just by looking at it. So the spender would know. So it's like all these little things. Like I, um, it's basically kind of like the double spend problem and cryptocurrencies were somewhat invented to solve that problem. So. Yeah, it's just a little, little hobby of mine, I guess. Like, how can we make Monero more like actual cash? But, but anyway, um, that difference does constitute a barrier or at least a source of friction for, for adoption. Um, if you can imagine what adoption would be like if we could just, like, give people Monero, they don't have to, like, willingly learn how to accept it. I think that would be a different story. Yeah. It could just be a dream. <laughs> no, that, I think the, you know, we should definitely be thinking along those lines. Um, one of the things we had also talked about too was, I mean, just the fact that Monero is obviously being used in the dark markets. Um, um, but why, why is it that it's not being used more there yet? So like there's your early adopter, right? So why, why are we not seeing Monero be, being the only cryptocurrency that's okay. essentially used on the dark markets? So I think we're actually seeing the emergence of that uh, White House market has just um, I think they actually they made their initial proposal like four months ago, um, something like that. And um, and they're Monero only They're They want to you know be the most secure uh, dark net market and they want to prioritize the safety and security of their buyers and their sellers. Um, and so like you have to 
like all their stuff is encrypted and you have to upload your PGP key and like other people have to, like you have to, uh, I think a, you have to like verify the, the marketplace operator, I think. But anyway, um, I think we are seeing it. I think that people are realizing that there's an issue with Bitcoin. Like I think people knew it, but you know, funny little, um, funny thing I'm learning lately is that people take positions publicly that are different from what they really believe privately or socially. Um, and so I think that like, you know, people have known about this for a long time, uh, but they, maybe they haven't really properly internalized that it's an issue, even if they've understood it rationally. And so, um, I mean, it makes complete sense if, you know, if you're looking at like the threat model of uh, being like a dark market operator or like a buyer or a seller, then, um, you want thing you want to reduce as many sources of metadata leakage as you possibly can. And so there's no reason not to make Monero mandatory, like the only currency. It's like, it's got the best privacy characteristics and like statements and so on. And it's, um, like in terms of, um, you know, like the, the, the principle of mandatory privacy applies to how many currencies you accept as well. Like if you have people accepting Bitcoin and other people accepting Monero, I'm pretty sure that you can gather some information about the participants just on that basis alone. So, um, so I think, yeah, I think we are seeing it, but you know, all this, like all this excellent, like good, good, I don't know. How do I make a categorical statement about this? Like Monero is like, it's a good project. And a lot of the time you see really good projects face a lot more struggles before they, they make the change that they were destined or whatever to make. Um, and it's just because of the fact that there is a change to make, I think like it's not, it's not something that's already familiar to people, but that's probably all that's necessary. Just like a measure of familiarity to people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Just jumping back to my Monero for a sec. So you built the API. Um, yep. So who are you seeing using it? So you mentioned, uh, one wallet are there are there a bunch of different wallets that are using it do uh anybody else that's using it other than wallets or obviously it's yeah so there are some hardware wallets this is actually something i forgot to mention there are some hardware wallets that um are looking at using our light wallet api the new one excuse me and um the part of the trouble is that uh Implementing Monero natively, like actually on a hardware device, is different from implementing pretty much any other cryptocurrency because the size of signatures is so large. So you can't easily keep them in secure memory uh, at the same time or like at, like one signature at a time even. Um, so so anyway, these, um, these groups that we've been working with uh, have often requested um, assistance in developing Monero-specific firmware for their devices. And so back in September, I think it was, uh, and like I said, a lot of this stuff takes a long time, but back in September, we started uh, collaborating with um, the founder of Riot, uh, Parasu, his first name is Matthias. He's um, an expert firmware developer and he's got quite a bit of expertise with hardware and um, he's done, a, you know, everybody's familiar with him now after his, um, uh, Chaos Computing Club work. Um, he did an excellent job organizing that. Um, I haven't had time to catch many talks from that, but I definitely plan to. But anyway, uh, we're working with him on this thing called the Monero Open Firmware Initiative, where we're developing shared common code that all these different hardware wallet companies can use to implement Monero on their own devices. And then the complement to that is in Monero Core, so, so like the firmware is on the device itself, but then um, you always need some software application to talk to it. And so the software application at the moment, um, in the absence of like, for example, ledger support in my Monero, the software application is like Monero CLI or Monero GUI. And those both talk to the ledger device, for example, um, through code that's in the application called like an HW device. And so that HW device talks to the firmware and it has its own little language. And so um, developing the other side of that for each, uh, for each of these companies, like the HW device part, um, a lot of that can be standardized, but that's another aspect of this project where it's like, okay, 
Um, like for example, um, uh, Trezor did a lot of work to, um, to make a great protocol for doing, uh, cold signing on the device itself. Um, and that required a lot of work. And I think that we can standardize a lot of that stuff because it's already in the Monero core repository. Um, so anyway, so, so that stuff has been going on. And so we see adoption there. That's just a no brainer for all of these groups because they don't want anything to do with, um, the technical overhead of understanding how Monero transactions are supposed to be constructed. It's, you know, but then if, um, if there's a group that suddenly has come to them and said, Hey, we can provide you all that functionality for free plus expert guidance, like, you know, cause we know how this stuff works and like, we've already done it for these other three hardware companies. Um, they they just jump on it. And so, uh, they, they use our light wallet server for scanning because you can't, you, you can't, um, scan on the device, obviously. And so the better experience is just, um, have it scanned in the background at all times so that, you know, they plug in their device and it's like immediate, the wallet balance is just immediately updated. It's immediately available because it's like scanning on the server. So there's that, um, there are, um, there's so uh, Bitfi uses uh, the My Monero infrastructure for its Monero support that began uh, last summer, and then um, we're also seeing. I guess I can disclose this now. Uh, Zelle has to use our infrastructure, Zelle Core. Uh, they've got a wallet as well, and they started using our stuff back in December, and they're integrating the the real time system as well. Uh, they're they're one of the early adopters of that. Um, there are other groups who are, uh, in, well, there are plenty of groups who have investigated it. Um, plenty as in, well, maybe on the order of, let's well, see. The thing is like, it's, it's very tough to, to reach out to people sometimes. Cause, um, like in a cold context, you don't necessarily know if they really saw your message. Um, but I've reached out to a bunch of people. I've spoken with, um, spoken with a lot of them. I mean, I think the primary thing is that, um, it takes time for people to switch over. And at the moment, um, the only real candidate for this would be someone integrating Monero for the first time instead of switching over from an existing system. Uh, we are making it free for Edge to switch over because they were an existing customer. Um, and we expect to see them uh, integrate that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, there are, there are some other investigations and stuff that are stealth, so to speak. I can't really disclose them because it would, you know, basically ruin their, their advantage. But, um, but the, you know, part of the problem was that because all this stuff takes such a long time and, you know, uh, new technology needs to be released first, I think, and people need to vet it to some degree. Um, because of that, my Monero needed to figure out some other, like business activities to pursue in the short term. Um, cause you know, months were, were put into that. And as many people as we got interested in Monero and as many people as we like for as many, for as many people as we showed how easy it was to integrate Monero, we still didn't really get the results in the short term that we wanted. And we only really expect to see those after like maybe four months from now or something like that. There's probably going to be a massive wave of integration after this. Cause now integrating Monero is just ridiculously easy for wallet providers. It's, it's extremely easy. Um, the other thing I forgot to, to mention this, this new API was really some, something I was extremely excited about for many, many months. Um, I still am, but it's, uh, I have something that's slightly more exciting to me actually, to be honest, but, uh, there's, um, there's some really cool things this API can do. So everyone's been talking about like the difference between full wallets and light wallets. And I think that there's a little bit of a misconception in the community, maybe among people who haven't been around like since like, um, like the need for a light wallet server existed. Um, but so how do I put this? Like basically a, a lot of people don't really seem to have much clarity on what makes my Monero different from the other wallets. And it's that light wallet server that is always scanning in the background and so the thing is, though, in order for it to do that, um, it's got to uh, obtain the view key from the user. And so that has the privacy downside, of course. Like we can tell, we, like we, like the server, that's like we, not that we look at it, except for like support cases and stuff, but um, we can see every transaction 
we can see which transactions involve an output that is decodable by that view key. So it might not even be your own transactions. We still have to send all that stuff to the client. And then the client uses the spend key to determine you know, which transactions are actually its own, uh, plus which, one of them, which ones of them are outgoing rather than incoming. Um, so, so anyway, this new API, it has a secondary mode called like the, the collection of which, you know, the collection of these two modes is just like hybrid basically. But the, the, the secondary mode is the hybrid mode where you can say, okay, server, I'm not going to send you my view key, just stream blocks to me and I'll scan. So it's a full wallet. But, but the, oh, that's cool. the crazy thing that's cool. is you're coding to the same API in your application and you get both modes for free at the same time. So it's completely different from the current way that people are building Monero wallets where they're like, okay, I want to, I have to decide between full wallet and light wallet. And if I go the full wallet route, um, it's like extremely complicated to either like, well, so like with wallet, the, the Monero wallet code, which is the full wallet code, it's like, it's basically impossible to use it in any maintainable, like, business context even without just accepting the entirety of the wallet code, including like all the dependencies and stuff. And this is what a number of uh, wallet providers do. But, um, you know, you get the Monero community maintaining it for free for you, but it also gets broken sometimes. And it's also more complicated to use. Um, it's very complicated to use sometimes. Um, and so this, the my Monero system now encompasses, it's now a superset of all those different modes. And, but you know, developers are just coding to one API, so they don't have to, you don't have to do the, the same work twice. So I think, I think it's, it's extremely compelling, but it's the sort of thing that is more applicable to new, uh, new projects for the most part. Yeah, no, that seems like, yeah, no, that uh, seems it will really help projects like you said, easily adopt and add Monero. Is there a business model that you have there for, for companies that are using your API? Yep, there is. And so we have, um, we charge, uh, like edge, for example, we charge them by active wallet per month. And it's just like a, a fixed fee per active wallet per month. Um, I was, I, I structured initially, um, kind of like a per second WebSocket uh, pricing plan. But eventually I just decided like, we'll just make the WebSocket system free because um, it's better for adoption. And so, um, yeah, we, we do offer like this so-called bulk enterprise hosting. Um, there's a bunch of other cool stuff I haven't really mentioned even, but there are alternatives to that, that model as well. So that model is basically where uh, you know, a wallet comes to us and says, we've got, you know, 5,000 users or whatever. Can you scan all of them for us? And can they hit your API through our application? Another alternative is, um, you know, you, for example, let's say you're like an OTC trader or something like that. And maybe you're even doing some of these OTC trades in person because you're using it um, like local Monero or something like that. It would be, it would be necessary to confirm you've received Monero before you hand someone cash or whatever it is that you're giving them. Um, but if you're walking around and you know, you're going to go do this deal in public, you don't necessarily want to bring your private, your private spend key with you. So the same system can be used to observe deposits to a wallet or to a sub address or whatever, and then have it, you know, immediately send to your SMS or your email or your telegram or a custom website endpoint uh, to notify you of deposits. So it's like a safer way to, to get notified. So that would be, um, that would be like a high scale, um, high scale deposit monitoring arrangement, which, you know, all this stuff is already structured and stuff. Um, and then another alternative is, uh, we could, uh, we could look at an onsite installation as well. Um, which, uh, comes with, you know, some additional maintenance overhead, but it's going to be much better than maintain, than, than maintaining your own, like, uh, you know, RPC, wallet RPC integration. Um, so yeah, that's another thing I should mention. Um, I developed a kind of like a something that, like a, a server that pretends to be wallet RPC and the daemon RPC, which is basically how all of vast majority of companies are integrating with Monero. Um, I developed a server that pretends to be that, but it, it 
uh, backs out into the new WebSocket API. So you can, you don't have to change your application code at all. Um, like if you don't want to maintain an on-site installation or whatever, uh, you could just keep the same RPC calls and uh, instead just, you know, it'll hit the server that is, um, that's actually handling the scanning for you in the background. Um, wallet RPC is an interesting one. <laughs> I could talk about that too. You can only use one wallet at a time with it. You have to open a wallet, do your operations, and then close the wallet. So that's why it's completely untenable for any of these wallet companies to use something like wallet RPC. And that's like basically the reason why the light wallet server exists. Cause like you need a multi wallet scalable way to do it. And the RPC wallet system is not performant enough for that. Um, so yeah, um, there's a model and there's, um, there's definitely a lot of value, uh, or rather there's a lot of like, it's definitely useful is what I mean to say. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's a strange thing. Um, the, the open source contributions we've made, uh, in some senses have actually made it now possible for, uh, some companies to not really have to worry about whether like, for example, like they, there's been a lot of uh, trouble with the performance of open Monero, which is a community alternative. But, um, and then there was a C plus plus implementation that we released like two years ago or something. Um, because of that kind of work, it's less necessary for companies to only come to us. We don't really have like a monopoly on that capability anymore, but um, we do have the fastest system out there. It's like most optimized and, very secure weathered years of attacks. So, um, aside from that, I think that, I think it could be helpful for a lot of these companies to have Monero expertise. It's like, you know, at the beginning of the year or like the end of the fiscal year, beginning of the fiscal year or so on, a lot of them have not really understood that they can actually verify the activities of a collective set of wallets that they have access to. Um, there's just so much expertise that is gathered in, in examining wallets and auditing them and making proofs about the contents and activities of them and things like that. So, um, yeah, so we're like, doing that, but, uh, but yeah, now I'm, I'm more interested in this, this merchants thing. Okay. Like I want to, I want to help people actually like earn Monero. That's my thing. But you, you kind of thought, as a business owner, um, as somebody who's kind of um, creating this technology, do you find it a little frustrating um, that, you know, dealing with open source and the fact that you're saying that, you know, you build this technology and sometimes it, it loses its value because it's, it's obviously that's the nature of open source. Uh, do you find that sometimes being frustrating or overall you see the value in, in it contributing to the larger open source project we call Monero? Yeah, I don't, I don't see it frustrating. I don't see it as something that would frustrate me uh, that our work makes it that, that we're sort of like, um, you know, introducing this technology that, that we could have kept proprietary and private. Um, like I'm happy to see Monero growing um, and so many people can benefit from this and so many cool things can be built on top of these new APIs. Like the the notify the notification service that I mentioned for OTC traders and stuff, and like the RPC wallet thing, and there's just so many applications. So, um, aside from that, um, Monero came from open source stuff, and my Monero is funding itself and giving that money effectively for free to the community in a way. But, um, but you know, we we're consumers of open source technology. So it, it kind of reminds me of this quote from the Tao Te Ching, which is like 2000 year old work of uh, like Taoist poetry, something like um, heaven and earth survive forever because they don't exist for themselves, which is not necessarily applicable to a company, but I think it's interesting to look at open source from that perspective because it's like, you know, we don't really have a reason to be doing what we're doing if there's no one who's going to benefit from it. And so really what we're doing is we're just like giving, we're like serving other people. We're serving the world. And that includes the community. And there are so many benefits to open source as well. Like the, the um, integrity of our code and the, the trustworthiness of it um, has, you know, 
been multiplied massively because we've had so many people looking at it. And, you know, the fact that other people get to use it just lends legitimacy to us. Um, everyone probably knows that, well, probably a bunch of people know that Monero Moo used to maintain this cold wallet generator in, um, it's like a, a little, like a web, web application that you transport to your cold wallet laptop or whatever it is, and you run it and it generates a, a wallet for you. Well, that code came from my Monero. And so like everyone's cold wallets are like, you know, it's like from the, the code that, that my Monero initially released. And I think that's cool because if anyone is like, Hey, like, are you sure your seed generation mechanism is sound? Well, I can be like, well, you know, like people have been using it for a long time and you know, it's undergone all these reviews and stuff. So, um, having said that it's a fine line and like, I think you, you have to like, you have to find something that, um, that allows you to survive while you're doing the most good, I think. And there's no implicit conflict between the two. And I think that's especially visible in Monero where everyone it seems it should be the case as far as I can tell that people are incentivized to, to contribute to this like thing that everyone's consuming. Yeah. It's an ongoing. The jury's still out. How about that? Right. <laughs> and at, at least with Monero and cryptocurrency in general, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if things are being done right. The price goes up and you own a piece of it as opposed to maybe other open source projects where it really, uh, you know, you're, you're doing it for, for the passion and the belief, but without the, the direct ability to profit from the success of the project. That's true. Although I don't necessarily think Monero could be said to be a good um, project to contribute to if you want to speculate on the price. Like, you know, like per personally, like, you know, I, ho I, I have some Monero for like transactions and stuff and uh, the my Monero business receives its, um, its payments from the hosting customers in Monero. So and I use my Monero for that, by the way. Um, I use the desktop version of course, because I don't, you know, like it's either like install secure browse and check secure browse every time, or I can look at, you know, the desktop application instead. But, um, so, you know, aside from that, like, I don't, I don't, I think like you basically already need a significant amount of starting capital that you've invested in, like invested, in other words, bought Monero with, for that to be something where you even see proceeds from that, like significant proceeds, like especially like operational capital. Um, and it's it's risky to hold it. business capital in Monero sometimes, like like only hold it in that. Um, and anyway, point is like. Uh, I guess like I have good incentives here too, because it, you know, I'm not like, I'm just trying to pump Monero. Like I'm actually trying to build useful stuff. And I hope that, um, I, I, I definitely believe that there are wholesome business models that companies can establish. They just need to be creative. Yeah. How about, um, people running their own, my Monero server, you had talked about that in the past. So is that something that people are now doing that's easy to do? Yep. Yeah, we see a ton of companies doing that. Uh, we've had some companies turn us down because, like, uh, you know, our our monthly minimum for hosting fee was too high, so they had their development team go and, you know, contribute to Open Monero and and optimize it so that it was more viable for them to run it. And so, you know, like for the lower scale, lower like lower scale requirement uh, groups, that kind of thing is more viable. And you also, and of course, you know, you have the the question of like you know, should you disclose your view keys to these people, but it's free to, it's effectively free to generate a Monero wallet. So you can disclose your view key to whoever, if you want. But, um, and then people are running them at home. Uh, these servers, you know, you can connect to a custom server through the my Monero application, but it's not as easy as I'd like it to be, um, to run a light wallet server at home. You know, you have to have significant expertise. Is, so, that, is that something you're thinking about? Because, I mean, I, I could see that as being something that a lot of people might be interested in, you know, like, kind of like that power user that wants the the quickness of my Monero, but also doesn't want to sacrifice the privacy, but doesn't have the technical abilities or know how to, to get there. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, from a hosting perspective, because you're going to need to be able to access it from the Internet, 
you need to like you know you need to have like the ability to open up a port or configure your firewall in such a way and you either need a static ip or you need some sort of dynamic uh, dns setup or something like that um, and it's probably also a good idea to get a like an ssl certificate hooked up um, you know before we before we get uh, things set up with like i2p for example but I'm definitely thinking about that. I put a lot of thought into that over the years and some work as well has gone into it. We've started um, foundations of partnerships with a, a couple companies that are working on at home node devices. So like uh, I can't really say who, but um, there, there are a couple really good ones in the Monero space, but it's taking them a long time to be able to, um, to ship something like that. And so we're providing expertise to them. Um, I think it's, I think it's going to happen just as a matter of like, this is the best way to access Monero. Like it, it just makes sense to have a light wallet server that runs next to a daemon. You know, it's effectively a, like an API to the daemon in a way, or, um, an alternative to the, the RPC wallet, um, or rather wallet RPC server. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of these companies are just still in the, the process of even getting their products out in the first place. Um, I myself am interested in, you know, like getting a Raspberry Pi and or whatever, you know, whatever like cheap device or expensive device, like it depends, there are two ways to do this, um, that would be able to run something like that um, and even be able to mine for you and stuff. There's so many possibilities there. It's... Um, it's honestly, it's just a matter of me not having the the capital to execute on something like that yet, because um, I would definitely do that. And you know, we would like we would maybe sell it on Cipher Market or like start our own web store or something like that. And um, we have all this like these really interesting designs that we want to make special merchandise for, like limited run stuff. So. Um, but anyway, um, I'm thinking about it. It's, <laughs> it's a matter of time and funding for the most part. Um, I've got so many ideas and things that I've wanted to do, but we've got to, we've got to be able to, you know, build a business that can, it's like an engine of some kind that can actually like, you know, survive and keep going. So, um, yeah, we'll get there. Yep. Yep. Um, and I know one of the other things you had spoken about, um, in past episodes, and I guess you touched upon it a little bit today, we're just trying to be able to seamlessly maybe transfer between something like Bitcoin and Monero through my Monero, where you, you don't even really kind of realize you're doing it. So maybe your your crypto is being stored in Bitcoin or being stored in Monero, and you're transacting in one or the other, vice versa. Is that something you've uh, made progress on? Yeah, totally. So. Thanks for asking about that. I actually forgot to mention that uh, things are a whirl. Like I've been traveling nonstop for weeks and working nonstop for weeks. And um, yeah, so the user wouldn't be, the user wouldn't store, uh, like we, we have like a very strong commitment to Monero as like the basic store of value or like the basic source of transactions. And so, uh, you know, we're like strongly committed to providing like native Monero support for that. And we don't have any plans at the moment to, um, to provide support for like Bitcoin wallets in the application. We have had some interest in expanding our WebSocket API to include support for Bitcoin and Ethereum. Like, uh, I mean, uh, Bitcoin and Tron, not Ethereum. I forgot that Ethereum is not cool <laughs> anymore. Uh, but, um, so that, that's, that's an interesting option there. That's all, you know, spec and designed as well. But, um, yeah, so the, the cross currency exchange thing, the idea there is, well, you know, it's like XMR.2, for example, like I want to be able to pay two other currencies with Monero, or I want to be able to deposit from another currency into my Monero wallet. And so both of those are fully implemented. Um, we, we actually have, um, we have a system that basically sits in front of exchange partners um, and the My Monero application talks to our API, which then uh, is involved in submitting orders and stuff like that. Um, so that helps us provide a, a better experience for connecting transactions with uh, exchanges and stuff like that. But 
Um, so that's fully implemented on the server. It's just waiting on the client side, the application to be implemented. I actually designed it uh, fully a couple weeks ago. Um, like a this uh, like everyone knows that my Monero has been working on Android forever, and uh, part of the thing that was making that take so long is I was re-implementing the application in C++, like the, the majority of the application, because I was thinking, well, I want to share all that code across all these different code bases, and like I'm effectively like a single developer on these applications, um, maintaining all of them, and maintaining all of them is not the issue. It's more like iterating on features across all of them. It's almost demoralizing in a way to have to build the same thing three or four times, and um, so anyway, uh, I was thinking, well, C++ and Android would use the C++ thing. But um, over the past two years, uh, and by the way, that's like, I've made a lot of progress on that. There's a significant amount of progress there. So if I wanted to go that route, I could. But um, over the past like two years, there's been a lot of like maturation that's happened in the React community. Uh, React is a framework for building applications. And it wouldn't really be interesting to me because, like normally, because I actually personally don't think React solves the problem that people think it solves. I don't think it really has anything to do with like managing UI complexity. Well, it does a little bit, but it doesn't actually solve that problem. Anyway, you can tell I'm opinionated about that, but um, it wouldn't be interesting to me except that um, except that recently there's this thing that's come out called Expo, uh, which is a way to develop applications. Um, using React Native, which is like React for mobile devices, and it also compiles the application for web with something called React Native for web, which is like full circle. Like we're taking React Native code, which was going to go to the mobile apps, but we're going to turn it into something we can run in a browser instead of using React so that we can use the same code base. And so you can use that to actually construct a desktop application too using Electron. And so I've got some other technical developments there that make it even sweeter than that. But I recently realized like, hey, it makes a lot more sense to just like take our existing JavaScript code base, which, you know, it's got everything that we need for the application. Um, and then take the existing MyMonero core JS, uh, which we actually recently migrated away from because we were, thought we were gonna go to the C++ route. but Take that as well, and then just like build a new UI out of React Native code that we can use across every single platform. And it's like we don't have to di diverge the code at all for any of these platforms, except in very specific cases in the UI where, like, you know, we want to show like Android can do this, but iOS can't, or something like that. Those sorts of situations. Um, so, so I put a lot of research into that end of December and. Uh, you know, that's off to the races as well. And so the cross-currency exchange is included in that. Uh, and that's been, the design for that has been uh, significantly revamped, um, you know, taking a lot of feedback. Like some people actually preferred the old My Monero design because it was like more spacious and uh, the transactions table was a little bit easier to read and copy from and stuff. Um, so it's also been like in this redesign, there's been a lot of effort well, some effort put into um, making things a lot simpler to build just so it can be built like way faster because there were a lot of uh, like little sort of extra things that we initially didn't realize we didn't need in my Monero app. One of them, one of them is a, a little bit embarrassing to talk about in a way, but it's like, okay, you're creating a new wallet and you um, like you're maybe you don't know about Monero you don't really know how important it is to keep this mnemonic seed secret and backed up because we can't recover it for you. And so like we built, we designed with a, a really, really good designer and we built these screens that, um, you know, educate the user and uh, allow them to back up the seed that they get and also confirm that, like basically prove to the application that they wrote it down um, just to like as like a protective measure for the user by entering the first seven, like by having them enter the first seven words. And it turns out that like, it doesn't solve the problem because people still just like ignore all the things. They just click accept and they, and as for proving that they can enter the seed words, they're just like, well, this application is annoying. It's like making me enter these words. Like 
I wrote it down, you know. So anyway, like five steps, five screens got turned into one screen, and you know, uh, certain like aspects of like excessive, uh, not excessive, but like um, like basically things are going to be a lot cooler. Like I've, I, I've been listening and observing very carefully when like I see people use my Monero and um, you know, the things that are not immediately intuitive to them are things that um, uh, a lot of the time they have to automatically, that they, they have to like manage for themselves. Like when you make a new request, like you're manually making a request and like you're manually, you know, you can like delete it when you've sent it to the person and stuff like that. So, um, that's annoying, you know, it's like, it's like work and the application should help you instead of like, despite keeping records for you, making more work. So, um, there are a lot of, a lot of interesting things. One of those is the ability to deposit, uh, into Monero from like Bitcoin, you know, or these other currencies. Um, yeah, so that's exciting. And Android. And, and so yeah, sure. when do you think we'll, uh, we'll see an Android release so i need to um i need to get my shit together no i need to (laughs) i need to um like verify a couple things first get a few things out of the way but then um so i i'm not really sure but I'm, i'm hoping like in a few weeks basically like that's the idea um it's just a matter of being able to turn my attention to it and the the other thing i was gonna interrupt myself to say is that um are you familiar with Isthmus? He's, um, his name is Mitchell. Yeah. He's one of the researchers. Yeah. He does like a bunch of data science. So he's got this, um, he's, he's like the head of the blockchain program. I don't remember his exact title, but head of blockchain program at this um, school here called Insight. And he's got these eight like masters and like, uh, like I think a couple of them are like PhD students and um, like, you know, uh, post undergrad um like basically graduate students for computer science who are working with him and um, they have to work on like uh, blockchain specific projects because they're becoming, they're, they're these blockchain fl- fellows. And so they're, they're doing all this work. So um, Mitchell is um, having them work on Monero. And one of them is also interested in uh, helping out with some of these react native components because the whole application, this whole new application that's been designed is, constructible with a small set of beautiful but very simple um and easy to build components and so i'm just like able to just give them to whoever is interested and so that's the cool thing that's one of the cool things about react i'll say is like they standardize to some degree how you build ui components uh you basically provide all the data that the component needs to show itself and you um kind of like wire up you, you expose wires, shall I say, for um, events that happen inside of the component, like someone tapping on a button. Um, and because that's standardized, it can be built in isolation and it can be like delivered in isolation too. Um, so um, so that's, that's an interesting thing uh, for me about like, it's like the, the combination of like a much simpler UI to build, the fact that the majority of the business logic is done already and the components are, you know, um, easily buildable in isolation. So hoping soon, but, um, you know how things go in reality. Yeah. No, I don't, uh, no. There's always things. That's it. I'll have to ask, uh, Mitchell more about that. I know he had mentioned that in the past. I didn't know, uh, they were actively working on Monero things now. Yeah. Um, I went in and I gave a talk on Monero one of those days that I was over there and, uh, I have to get back there. I've just been so slammed. But the, um, one of them is working on this little proposal that I don't really want to say too much about because Mitchell might be upset with me for revealing it. But it's some um, it's something that you know it's going to result in a pull request to Monero and uh, potentially a consensus rule change, and it's potentially a space saver for Monero. Um, another one, I have a, a Monero proposal that um, is involved in this this thing that I'm working on lately that I think could be quite appropriate for one of them to tackle. Um, and it's great because, you know, now it's this set of like highly trained people who have exposure to actually making pull requests from an arrow. And, you know, I think that it's, um, I think it's awesome that, you know, we have people who are contributing like that. 
So, so yeah, reach out to him. I'm sure he'd be happy to talk about it. Yeah, definitely. We had him on and we've had him on in the past. Uh, he had mentioned it then, but I don't think they were actively working on any yeah. concrete Monero projects at the time. Yeah, I think the blockchain fellows had just come in like a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago. Very cool. So yeah, another thing I realized when I went back and watched our old video, it was uh, it was actually pre bulletproof. It was like Ooh. it was that August before. So I mean, just to see how far we've come since then is is exciting. And I guess my question is, um, what are you excited about in terms of technical improvements to the protocol? Is there anything in particular that you're looking at, like triptych? Is it triptych? Is that what am I saying it correctly? Uh, I don't remember triptych. Probably triptych is a word. <laughs> I know. I know. There's there's a, there's, there's a like lot. A there's a lot yeah. being talked about right now in the Monero Research Lab about potential improvements to the ring right. uh, uh, ring signatures. Um, but is there anything in particular that you're excited about in terms of possible mm -hmm. uh, technological advancements in Monero itself? Well, here's an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. This is not strictly a technical advancement so much as maybe a research result, but it seems to be the case that, um, like last time we spoke, we were probably pretty concerned about ring size. Like, well, you know, is ring size going to be big enough, but it's fine. Like, you know, you actually, it turns out mathematically, it looks like you only need a relatively small ring size to make a gigantic anonymity pool with certain other characteristics, of course, like, you know, mandatory or rather default privacy. Um, so it might not be as big of a deal as we thought. Of course, ring signatures do come with the problem of implicating other people or like, you know, the statistical analysis problem of taint and so on. But, um, yeah, I, nothing, nothing strictly like, like really excites me at the moment. Um, aside from, I guess just like, hmm. Yeah, nothing, nothing in particular at the moment. I think that we're in one of those phases where the technology is catching up with what we want it to do and we're like optimizing things. And once we, once we get to the point where things are very well optimized, I think we'll be in a situation where we understand what we want a little bit differently than before. Like, um, you know, it would have been great if, um, like we, we, we thought back in the past, it would have been great if like there's a, a like a ZK Stark that is efficient because then we wouldn't have to have a trusted setup and we could just adopt that immediately. But now it might not be as big of a deal. Like we, maybe we don't even really care about that anymore. So, um, you know, because of the, the ring size, uh, result and the fact that there's work going on right now that, um, makes it so that the, the ring signature size is acceptable because of optimizations like space optimizations. Um, yeah, but I will admit, uh, as revealed by my um, temporary unfamiliarity with your mention of Triptych earlier, that I'm not keeping as close tabs on uh, Monero Research Lab as I, I used to and would hope to. But um, I'm definitely going to Confranco. I'd like to give a talk there. Um, and it's it's mostly just, the, you know, head my head down, like nose to the grindstone, just trying to figure out how to make this work. Because I think that, I think my Monero is a um, really like useful organization. Um, so, so yeah, um, we're looking to start another, or we're looking to start the, the workshops back up. Uh, we were doing research lab workshops that we were hosting in Nashville and we're looking to start one of those in Q2 of 2020, I think. Um, everybody's been slammed. Like everyone's had their head down, I think to some degree. So how do you, um, how do you with, feel about Monero in general right now? I mean, um, so I guess we've been in a bear market obviously for quite some time. Uh, yeah. It seems like we're, we're coming out of it. Is that something you even pay attention to at all or what, what's sure. your, what's your take there? Yeah. I mean, I, I can't help but pay attention cause I'm on Twitter. <laughs> so, whenever we hit some like minor milestone, everyone's like, it still survived. Like, you know, we haven't been shut down yet or whatever, but uh, which is cool. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and the market itself definitely affects business. Like it affects how willing people are to do things and how able they are. So, um, but I think it's cool that, you know, having been in a bear market, we've, it hasn't dampened anyone's spirits. Like no one cares anymore. They're just like, okay, 
that's what a bear market looks like to all your newcomers. Um, you know, we're just going to keep grinding. Um, but I think that's awesome. Um, I feel good about Monero. I mean, I, nothing has changed my opinion about it or anything like that. Um, I'm, I think it's interesting to look at Monero, uh, in comparison to Bitcoin and see what relationship they have to each other. Because a lot of people make the argument, whether it's like a sound, complete argument or not, they make the argument that Bitcoin will be the global reserve currency instead of Monero because of the fact that it's transparent. Because of the fact that like if some whoever, some powerful entity decided to, you know, print money through some means that, you know, everything would be just basic arithmetic to verify the balances of things. And they say that with Monero, it's harder to do that because amounts are not visible. The counter argument to that, or there are actually a number of specific counter arguments, but um, one of them is that, well, basically inflating the monetary supply is a matter of tricking the, either the, the mathematics behind it or the implementation behind the verifiers of transactions like submissions of new transactions. And so, um, it, it's like a, it's like a math problem or a cryptography problem plus like the audit question. Um, but it's, it's not really a matter of like, well, um, is someone printing money and like, you know, does someone have like a trillion dollars of Monero that no one knows about? Well, not really if they can't ever spend it, it's not Monero at that point. It's just something that they can't ever use. Um, so I don't really think it's a it's the full picture of the the argument, but I do think that it's going to affect how people um, understand Monero over time and how they adopt it, because they might think that it's like less safe than a system like Bitcoin. And like, you know, we got into cryptocurrency because we wanted to get away from the inability to audit things and stuff like that. So we can audit things, um, but it's a. Uh, it's not, um, it's an indirect audit, I suppose you could say. It's like effective audit of the, of the supply that is. Yeah, that seems to kind of be like Monero's oh, final struggle is uh, kind of getting everybody over that hump of being okay with the fact that Monero is more abstract than Bitcoin in terms of being able to audit it. But I think we're okay because... There's a reason we're working on Monero. There's a reason we think privacy is important. And there's a reason we think that, well, so it's, it's important for many reasons, like anti-censorship, because if you can tell what's in a transaction, miners can choose not to include in blocks, potential blocks. Um, and, uh, you know, it's the fungibility argument's kind of been done to death. <laughs> well, not really, but it's, 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 it's obvious at this point, like that's, that's a relationship. There's like a theoretical relationship that can be established between a lack of privacy and a lack of fungibility and all these things like that. So Bitcoin is trying to become more private because people know that it's a real issue. The most technically adept people in the community have been saying like, yeah, that's something that we want to do. It's like, we're trying to work on that. Um, the, the biggest and most exciting proposals to people in Bitcoin right now are proposals that are supposed to help its privacy. And so one of the little like sneaky uh, arguments that like occurred to me one day that I think um, I'd be very happy if other people used it and maybe if they tried to poke holes in it or whatever is that, well, exchanges are going to face the same challenges listing Bitcoin that they face listing Monero in the very near future. And, perhaps even significantly greater risk to them because if, like for example these exchanges that are like yeah we support coinjoin like we're a more private exchange for bitcoin because we support coinjoin well actually the reality is that the risk to those exchanges is greater because now they're storing data about who did those coinjoins and they're going to get a knock on their door you know so it's like there's more attention there's more burden when using bitcoin and so there's there could well be a tipping point where they're just like we don't even consider bitcoin like more like economically um like preferable to using monero because like the challenges are effectively the same but the benefits are not and so that might happen um 
I don't think that Bitcoin is going to have an easy time of making itself private. And it may not ever even happen. Exactly, you know, part, not exactly, but partially because of the, the auditability and transparency thing that people are very concerned about. Um, so it's interesting. Bitcoin is, um, back in 2016 when I found out about Monero, it was because I was having trouble working on Bitcoin. You know, I wanted to contribute, but I wasn't really sure what I could do. And uh, part of that was just because I wasn't nearly as familiar with the computer science and the, the math behind it as I should have been, or, you know, to, to actually make a real contribution. But, um, but it's also that, you know, back then there was the, there was the issue about like, you know, big, big blocks versus small blocks and like, what kind of precedent does that set? Is it a real solution? Uh, and then, you know, you can't even necessarily solve that problem without changing the fixed emission cap. Uh, because of that attack and so if you can't change that then well that's like another one of those ideological things like the, it's not ideological per se because i can kind of understand how um coming to those conclusions could be like divorced from ideology it could be more of like an economic or a social contract type type argument but it still i think remains the case that um it's almost like people are uh not like if you even bring up the question of what bitcoin is it's either, well, it's what the white paper said, or it's, well, it's this ideal, or it's, well, you can't even ask that question because it's like fallacious. Like you can't, you know, you can like try to categorize something. So um, I think that's kind of problematic uh, with Bitcoin because if you can't really define what it is, or if it's just a matter of preserving what's there, that's static. And it's, we can't iterate on it. We can't contribute to it except maybe by preserving the economy around it. And that's just going to happen as a matter of like efficiency. It's not like no one's going to be convinced to do that unless it's valuable to them. So I don't know. It's, it could well be the case that, that Bitcoin ends up just remaining transparent. Um, yeah, I agree. I think it's kind of painted itself into a corner where, uh, it, it really can't evolve. Um, but yeah, that that's, that's where Monero comes comes in. Uh, I mean, just the fact that we that we upgrade every six months, I think, is indicative of how we're prepared to constantly uh, evolve towards being whatever we need to be to perform the functions of digital cash. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, that does present a challenge to exchanges and wallet providers, but on the other hand, that is also partially a business model for us. Because now, you know, we have such significant expertise in all this stuff. Um, but these, a lot of these exchanges experience downtime. Like they're literally losing money, which is like really bad for them because they're not aware of what's going on and, uh, or they don't have someone on the inside that's helping them to make the transition. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not really on the narrow. I think it's, I, I completely agree with you. It's excellent that we've set this precedent that like, this is something that's fluid. Like it changes will be made to it. That's it's that's one of its most important features. And I don't think I'd have any interest in working on Monero if that weren't the case. It goes right back to the culture. All right, I think that's a good place to leave it at. Cool. Thanks for thanks coming for inviting on, me. Yeah, thanks for uh, you know your candid thoughts as always. Appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. It's great and, to see you again, and yeah. uh, hopefully one of these days I'll catch you in New York. Or are you going to be at a conference? Soon? I'm sure you are. Yeah, I'm pl certainly planning on it. So as long as everything goes according to plan, I will be there. Okay, I'll brush up on my German. <laughs> All right, Ben. Uh, yeah, look forward to hanging out with you over there if I don't see you sooner. Absolutely. All right, All right take care. Thanks, Ben. Later. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.